The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. Ground control to Major Mike. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike. It's, uh, it's great to be back with you. And of course, this is another episode of The Unlikely Innovators. And this week, we are joined by Colonel Jeremy Hansen, who, as I'm sure many of you know, is going to be the next uh, Canadian astronaut uh, that is going to be on the Artemis II mission uh, to fly past the moon. Which we know is not, the moon is not done. Steve, you tried to yeah. tell Colonel Hansen that the moon's been done, but I think he <laughs> he uh, respectfully disagreed with you and yeah, said, yeah. no, the moon, is, the moon is far from done. Yeah, the as moon's as still as cool. Can, the, well, yeah, the moon is, he's bringing the moon back. Let's just yeah, say that. Although the moon never back. left. No, uh, but it's coming back in a big way. So no, we were we were uh, so appreciative to have Colonel Hanson on the podcast oh, yeah. today. I mean, it's uh, not to humble brag our listeners, but it's the second astronaut we've had on our podcast, yeah. which is not something that would have been on our bingo card no. when we started this journey uh, back in 2021. Um, but again, uh, just just a, an incredible guy to talk to. You could see how, you know, I think how driven he is uh, to go to the moon. Um, you know, there were some things that he said that obviously I think. You have to put into context that what they're doing is far more risky business than I think what a lot of us are doing here on Earth. But mm -hmm. I think when he's talking about the attributes of somebody that you need uh, that you need to have to become an astronaut, like when he's talking about operational, I just think of even in the business world, you need to have those skill sets as well, right? Like you're not always going to have the information at your fingertips to make a decision. And sometimes you're just going to have to take the best information that's available to you and make a decision one way or the other. And sometimes it's right. And sometimes it's wrong. And if it's wrong, you have to own up to it. Obviously, the risk register is far different when you're wrong in space. A little space bit. Than, I think it's a little it, bit different. Than it is here at Cambrian College. But but nevertheless, you can kind <laughs> of see how that's why these teams are so effective because they've they've selected, you know, good leaders and people who can work together as a team and as a group. And that cohesion, you know, really is the is is what uh, kind of pulls it all together. Absolutely. And uh and very inspirational, of course, right? I mean, these mm -hmm. uh countries lump a lot of expectation on astronauts and i think uh these are the folks that that rise to the top and rise to the occasion and can handle it so it was it was really humbling to to speak mm -hmm. uh with uh, colonel hansen today and i'm sure that our uh our listeners our listeners will enjoy it as well and perhaps what we'll do is go right to the interview uh with colonel jeremy hansen all right so we're back we're now pleased to be joined by colonel jeremy hansen uh, Jeremy has a bachelor's degree in honors of science and in, in, uh, with space science from Royal Military College of Canada. In 2003, Colonel Hansen completed CF-18 fighter pilot training at uh, 410 Tactical Fighter Operating Training Squadron. Uh, for the next five years, he served as a CF-18 fighter pilot with uh, 411 Tactical Fighter Squadron and 409 Tactical Fighter Squadron, as well as the Combat Operations Officer at Four Wing Operations, where his responsibilities included effectiveness of NORAD operations, deployed exercises, and Arctic flying operations. In 2009, Colonel Hansen was one of two recruits selected by CSA through the third Canadian astronaut recruitment campaign. Uh, in 2017, Colonel Hansen became the first Canadian to be entrusted with uh, leading a NASA astronaut class, which means that he was in charge of uh, the training of astronaut candidates from both the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and next year, uh, uh, Colonel Hansen will fly to the moon on Artemis on the Artemis II mission, the first crewed flight test of the Orion spacecraft launching on the SLS rocket. He will become the first Canadian ever to venture to the moon. But of course, before all that, he is now a guest on the Like the Innovator. So welcome to the show, uh, Colonel Hansen. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We're happy to have you. Uh, as as the show's title says, like it's called the Unlikely Innovators. So we often ask our guests about their unlikely journeys, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, yours is an unlikely one, just in, in in the sense that there are so few fighter pilots and astronauts out there. But before we get to you know your upcoming space space exploration journey, uh, we did want to ask you about becoming a fighter pilot. Uh, and the reason we wanted to ask this question is because perhaps it's actually not that unlikely that you would have become a fighter pilot because you talked about getting into air cadets at the age of 12 and, you know, how that kind of prepared you. So can you maybe reflect on, you know, maybe how your early journey into uh, aviation at, at a young age, maybe kind of paved the way uh, in, in your later career? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I became fascinated by airplanes at an early age. I can't really tell you why I just <laughs> fell in love with them. I'd never even been in an airplane, but I somehow knew I wanted to fly. And that led to uh, my dad somehow heard about air cadets and he said, hey, they'll like give you a pilot's license. And I'm like at age 12. And he said, yeah, I'm like, what? 
sure, I'll do it. So that's not quite true. Uh, he had some of the facts right, but not all of them. And the, you know, the, the reality is you have to be 16 to get your license. But what is true is they, you, know, you could go flying with the Air Cadets when you're 12. And you can start working on the, the pieces you'll need to become a pilot when you're 16 and get a private pilot license 17. Um, and ultimately, you know, upon reflection, looking backwards, Air Cadets really set me up. I mean, that program challenged me. I was pretty shy. I did not like to be out front. I did not like to be, you know, um, speaking in public or giving orders on the parade square. Air Cadets really pushed me and prepared me to join the, the Royal Canadian Air Force. I will tell you, you know, just in the way you phrase that question, I mean, there are no straight paths in life, you know, mm -hmm. but the only thing you can be guaranteed is if you set a goal uh, somewhere along the road, you're going to be tested. There's going to be some bumps. And, and you know, for me, that, that was very true. When I wanted to join the forces and become a pilot, they weren't accepting pilots for my graduation year. And uh, I actually joined as a combat engineer um, under the understanding that, you know, I could just put in for a, a transfer to pilot later um, as a, you know, an officer in the military. And that was a lot harder than, uh, than I kind of understood at the recruiting center. And um, that took a lot of perseverance. Um, I, you know, I actually enjoyed my training as a combat engineer. I was a member of the army um, and I would have continued in that trade had I not got my change, but it took a lot of perseverance and a lot of help. I had to ask a lot of people to help me figure this out because I really wanted that shot to fly for the for the Air Force. And I mean, that's already an unlikely journey to become a fighter pilot, obviously. Um, we had uh, Colonel Chris Hadfield on the podcast not too, too long ago, and he was able to really crystallize for me just how unlikely it is to become an astronaut. And, and, and to become an astronaut is one thing, but then actually then gets, you know, another layer of un unlikelihood is to then get selected to be part of a mission. So could you talk like a little bit about what that process is like, the selection process, you know, after you, you, you know, become an astronaut, how does that, be, how do you become part of a mission then eventually? Well, and, you know, the one thing I would say is, you know, every time we hire an astronaut, we do fully expect to fly them. Um, we, we're going to find a mission for them. That's the, that is the goal. Now the astronaut has to show up. They have to perform. Um, you know, getting selected by a Canadian Space Agency is probably the most grueling part of that that journey, like from a selection point of view. Um, and we're very careful about who we select. So, but once they're selected, as long as you continue to perform, and we don't have any, you know, we fully expect all the astronauts we hire are going to excel at this job because we have such a grueling process. Uh, once you're selected, you continue your training. You you are going to be put on a mission. Yeah, I mean, you know, so our astronaut corps only has four astronauts right now. So David St. Jacques, uh, he's already flown. Myself, Josh Kutrick, and Jenny uh, Jenny Gibbons, and um, they, you know, Jenny and Josh are going to fly in space. I mean, they're both amazing astronauts. So we're not down here fighting for a space mission. I don't want to give people that illusion, right. but we are putting our heart, we are pouring our heart and souls into human space exploration on a daily basis with a huge team of people at the Canadian Space Agency and our international partners around the world. Um, and that's, I think that's maybe the, um, the unlikely part is just, you know, how, how challenging that is, you know, day to day, what we're doing. I mean, as we're chatting right now, there are seven humans in space and that's not trivial. Um, yeah. And it presents challenges all the time. We are managing risk. I mean, people probably take it for granted, but we are managing risks. It's a risky business to have people living in the vacuum of space. And we're doing it every single day of the year um, for the last 23 years. Pretty incredible. And now we're going to be sending humans out to the moon. Um, so it just keeps getting better and better. And before before Mike asks another question, is that an image of the? I want to get the pronounced pronunciation. Is that the cupola behind you? Oh yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Oh cool. Yeah. I, I just saw. This is how lame I am. I just saw a TikTok about it, uh, not too long ago. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty incredible view. I haven't seen it. I've never flown in space. I mean, I've seen lots of videos and pictures uh, from there. Um, it's an incredible place to view the planet from. It gives you a 360 degree view, and then. This is actually where the Canadian, this is our new, um, our new um, uh, emblem for the Canadian Space Agency. But uh, this is actually a huge pane of glass, as you know, from mm -hmm. your TikTok video. And uh, it faces, it's parallel to the surface of the planet. So it's pretty incredible view. Yeah, they say it's just as good as uh, going on a spacewalk, but then 
the astronaut that was doing the TikTok said it's not as good as doing a spacewalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> there's yeah. no way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you know, Jeremy, we want to talk about uh, about the upcoming mission as well. But before we get there, I did want to pick up on something that you'd mentioned. And obviously, like going through, you know, the astronaut class program is is grueling, as you'd mentioned. And so there's all sorts of, uh, you know, I think those physical attributes that you're looking for, perseverance, being able to handle, you know, the, the grueling regiment. But in terms of other attributes you're looking for, you know, what are some of those characteristics that you're looking for in an astronaut when it comes to, you uh, you know, what they would bring to the team, what they would bring to the mission. Can you maybe talk a little about what you, what you're looking for in a person to, to kind of graduate to that, through that program? Yeah. So we look for the same things uh, in initial selection when we're, you know, trying to find astronauts to join the, the Canadian Space Agency, but also in that training period, which we call astronaut candidate training. And so there are three things. One would be very obvious, everyone academics, you need to have the ability to absorb lots of information, understand it. Um, so academic background is important. The second one I call operational skills, um, and that is, you know, the ability to operate in under pressure and to make decisions when the answers are not obvious. So, you know, this is something that I learned in aviation. I mean, as a pilot, you are constantly doing that where you don't know what the right answer is, but you know, you have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. And, uh, and you also understand that no choice is not an option. Um, that will be a bad choice. And so some people, that's just not their comfort area. They're not, you know, they're not really operationally minded. That's totally fine. Takes all sorts in this world. But we really do need those operators. There's people that can almost kind of feel into their intuition and just trust themselves to create a solution and have the confidence to make those decisions. And also make mistake, mistakes and admit them <laughs> and so that they can get it fixed right away. So that's operational skills. And then the third piece is, uh, we call them expeditionary skills here, but teamwork skills is really all it is. And uh, so we, we work a lot on that with respect to effective communication, honest communication, leadership, followership, self-care, team care. These things really matter to us. And we put, we put ourselves deliberately in challenging scenarios, even sometimes like living under the ocean, for example, for a week as a crew. So we can really work on those skills, managing risk together, but working on those skills to do it effectively. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, I'm trying to go through ever, I'm sure a lot of people go through their mind, like, can I do that? I mean, those are, uh, those are, that's quite a list. And I don't know that I'd necessarily be <laughs> good at each of those. That's a well rounded individual you're describing, obviously. Yeah. And I, you know, I think everybody can do those things. And I think everybody has to work on them. And that's what we find in the core is that we don't, People don't show up here and they're just magically perfect at it. We show up here and we, we put together a crew of people or a team of astronauts and there are going to be friction points and miscommunications and it's, it's it developing almost the reflex to dig into them and solve them. And you see this, you know, in the, in the workplace that, you know, workplaces that don't have maybe that they don't spend and invest the time and training to develop those skill sets. Um, you know, you can end up with an ineffective team mm -hmm which is really unfortunate because that team could have been really high performing and but that's what we're going for we don't have perfect people we just have humans um, but we we have built a reflex that hey we want to perform we want to create a high performing team it's going to take effort to get there for sure and and speaking of teams uh, you and a team uh, are are going to be uh, going back to the moon for the first time in a long time for for humans uh with the artemis 2 can you just sort of talk about that i mean i'm sure when you're a kid you know the moon's kind of been done at that point and then you're like will we ever go back and now this is the opportunity to go back can you talk about the mission and and sort of what that means to you yeah yeah i mean i've never viewed the moon as being done for sure and i, <laughs> and, I and i know now um you know the team that i'm working with here I, I just spent a few days uh in geology training you know talking about some of the things that we're expecting to learn and some of the kind of the secrets that are locked in the in the moon um the apollo samples have given us some really big hints um about you know what that what answers could be there and it's actually pretty exciting it just makes you want to get down to the surface and start <laughs> collecting samples so that we can start unraveling this mystery of our solar system um, pretty fascinating to think about. So the moon is definitely not done, but yeah, no, to answer your question. Yeah, we're going back to the moon. How are we getting there? Well, Artemis one was an on crewed test flight. First time the vehicle flew, um, and not all the pieces were there to support human life. Like we could not have put people on it. It was like, you know, we take these things stepwise approach. 
Uh, Artemis II is the first time we put humans on this rocket and first time we put them in that capsule called the Orion capsule. And so what we need to do in Artemis II is kind of test and stress the system to make sure it's ready to go into lunar orbit in the future and support astronauts on a longer stay on the moon. And the way we're going to minimize our risk on this first mission is we're actually going to leave planet Earth and we're going to go around it once. It's going to take about 90 minutes. We'll be in relatively low Earth orbit. That'll give us about an hour and a half to make sure this vehicle can keep us alive for about a day. And uh, if, if it's looking good after that hour and a half, we're going to burn the engines again and we're going to go out in a longer, more elliptical orbit. We're going to go really far from Earth, about 60,000 kilometers ish. Uh, that's far. Like that's further than the furthest satellites that provide, you know, satellite um, TV and satellite communication. Um, it's really far out. And so that is far enough that you will see the whole globe out the window. Everybody will be just in the in the window mm -hmm. um, which would be amazing to see and then we'll come racing back to earth and that'll be our next off ramp so you know we have to survive a day on that one as long as the capsule is performing well at the end of the day we'll burn again to go to the moon if it's not we'll just come home um, but hopefully we'll get that go for translunar injection it's called tli we'll burn the engines and then we'll head out and we'll go around the moon It'll take about eight days to, from that point to go out and come back from the moon We'll see the Earth get small in the window again. And we'll see the moon get big. And eventually we'll see the Earth from the back, from the far side of the moon through the, through the image of the moon. That'll be pretty spectacular to see. And all of this is just, you know, this is just the next step. And then after that, we're going to do Artemis three. We're going to take humans back to the surface of the moon. Um, it's pretty exciting. And I think uh, just one quick uh, add on to that. Um, I had heard Apollo, the, the, the Apollo astronauts that didn't land, uh, they said that they didn't feel any sort of uh, like they missed out at all because you're you're part of a process that gets the collective effort back to the moon. Is that sort of how you have to feel in that case when you see the moon go by, you know, uh, within reach? Yeah, I mean, I I know I'm going to be longing to walk on the moon when, <laughs> when we fly by. I'll be there'll be part of me that's wishing we could just go down and explore some more. I mean, who wouldn't want to go explore? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't eclipse the, you know, what you're talking about, which is the meaningful work of just taking humanity back. These things are not about an individual. They're about mm -hmm. humanity. Mm -hmm. And so um, this crew, I mean, we're pretty excited to be taking on this part of the challenge. And we're excited to support the people who would take on the next one and the one after that. Um, it's just cool to be part of it. And, you know, the astronauts become this very visible um, part of the team. But, like, it is literally thousands of people pouring their hearts into um, this endeavor and coming up with crazy solutions and amazing technology and things that will bring real benefit. I mean, this is putting people in their passion areas uh, and that's where you get the best out of people. You get the best results. So it's just fun to watch. I mean, the 10 day mission is going to be extraordinary for me, but um, the process from now to launch is equally extraordinary for me. This is something I'm really excited about. I, I kind of call the mission the icing on the cake. I, I'm going to enjoy baking this cake <laughs> as well over the next uh, couple of years. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and when you mentioned geology training, I just it just dawned on me as Steve and I are talking to you from Sudbury, Ontario, that like we didn't have a question for you considering the fact that like when they initially were going to the moon in the Apollo missions, they were coming to Sudbury to do some geology training because at the time it was this barren moonscape and they, they tried to get some intelligence from what they saw here in the time since then Sudbury is regreened and it's, you know, it's, it's not what it was once, but uh, once was, sorry, but, uh, but has Sudbury come up at all in, as part of the, the, the training and the process for, for you guys, at least maybe not now, but uh in the past, have you heard about those stories about going to Sudbury to see what we could learn about the rock formations here and what they say about the moon? Yeah, no, very much so. Um, yeah, we're all familiar with that. We're all very familiar with the, the training the Apollo astronauts did. Um, yeah, I work very closely with uh, Dr. Gordon Azinski from Western University. Um, and I've been uh, in numerous places in Canada exploring craters. I haven't been to Sudbury with him, but I know he takes students there you know, pretty much every year. Um, I've, you know, been in the, the museum there uh, or nearby, um, and uh, Canada actually holds some really unique areas for training, not just Sudbury, but some other craters that are really well preserved. Um, I was just speaking this morning. I may have the opportunity to go to Mistaston with uh, Dr. Ozinski, um, which is another crater 
Um, and so the, these are these are important because you know it's one thing to do something in a classroom, but to be a real field geologist on the lunar surface, mm -hmm. um, and even to look you know at the window and, and image take images of the right pieces for the scientists, and also to observe with the human eye, which can see things that the the cameras just will not, um, and the human brain to kind of filter that you need to have context of what you're looking for and what you're looking at. And so these these real life field trips are very, very important. And I don't know, Sudbury could be on the map someday. There's many options, so it's hard to say where we'll, where we'll end up in the end. Well, ho hopefully, but again, it's, it's just, I just remark how different things have become in the last 40 years. Right? I think certainly there's still that geological formation here, but I think just like it's a little more lush and green than it once was in the seventies. And that's a good thing. But uh, before we let you go, Jeremy, it's uh, you know, it's, we wanted to have a little bit of fun with you. It's obviously almost summer, which means it's like blockbuster uh, season at the movies last year, Top Gun, you know, Maverick was all the rage. Um, and, you know, we've had uh, Colonel Hadfield in the podcast before and we've asked him about how space is depicted in movies. Um, but we wanted to ask you, given how popular Top Gun was last year. When you're looking at a movie that is include that includes like fighter pilots and aviation, like what are the sorts of things that you're looking for to find out if it's accurate? Can you enjoy a movie like Top Gun, or are you just yeah. kind of picking it apart, saying like, ah, oh, no, that wouldn't work. They can't do this. And how do, how do you how do you enjoy a movie like that? And what are the things that you look for to assess whether or not it's it's true to life? Yeah. Um, you know, I think different people take different approaches. When I watch a movie, you know, I, I kind of set my expectations a little lower. I know what the purpose of it is typically, you know, you know, hopefully a lot of movies like Inspiration, for example. And uh, a movie like Top Gun definitely inspired me as a, as a young person to, to want to be a fighter pilot. And I know it, it still serves that purpose today. But, I, you know, I would definitely give them credit on that one. For example, they filmed a lot in the real airplane. You know, they went to great lengths to do a lot of the filming and I was loving it and eating it up because like that was taking me back to fly in the F-18 and you know, all the, a lot of the imagery is shot backwards looking through one of the actors who's sitting in the backseat of a real jet. Uh, but you're seeing the wings and the flaps move and you're seeing the vapes come off, you know, the vapor trails come off the wings and you're seeing the tail shake. And like, that's, that's, that's real. <laughs> and I loved watching that. So, but you know, space movies, it's the same thing. Sometimes they get some parts right. They don't get everything right. Um, like The Martian, for example, um, you know, there are a few things there that were not super believable to me, but a lot of them were. And one of the things I really appreciated about that movie, for example, was they, they really captured how the team in mission control tackles problems and how they work through them together to, fit, to create a solution. Um, you know, you don't always see that. I think they did a really good job of capturing that. The other thing they, they did a good job um, you know, with Mark Watney was that never give up attitude. Like you don't have to know how you're going to survive. You just have to know that you're going to try. And those are the kinds of people that we're looking for. You know, I, I want to go to space with somebody that if it looks really dire and we think it's all probably all finished, I don't want to die curled up in a ball. I want to die trying. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's, you know, that's what we saw in that movie. And I, that, I find those things are very inspirational. I don't have to get all the facts right, but it's very, very inspiring. Well, I can't think of a better place to leave it. That was a very inspirational answer, and we'll we'll always uh, be looking at movies a little differently. Uh, r right before you go, uh, just a one-word answer, if you can. Uh, your personal preference kit is something that's always uh, of interest. Can you share one thing that you you're planning on bringing in that uh, small uh, kit with you? Yeah, family. Something for the family. Family photo and some for the family. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us on the Unlikely Innovators, uh, uh, Jeremy Hansen. And then on, obviously <laughs> from Mike and I, good luck in your yeah. uh, preparations and Enjoy your training. Enjoy the process and good luck. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me today. And thanks for uh, sharing a little bit about this mission with uh, our fellow Canadians. Uh, we have really, really high hopes for this mission. Um, it doesn't have to go perfectly, but we do want Canadians to have that same sense of pride and knowing that there's incredible genius in our country. I've seen it over my career as an astronaut, just constantly amazed by what people are able to do and what they have done. And I appreciate the fact that you're sharing a bit of this with uh, our fellow Canadians. I hope they're proud and I hope sometimes we keep ourselves small and I hope mm -hmm. people realize, hey, we're sending a Canadian to the moon, not because of Jeremy Hansen, we're sending a Canadian to the moon because we have amazing capability in our country and our people are doing incredible work. It's recognized in the world stage and the international partnership wants us alongside.
that's a feather in our cap. Thank you, gentlemen. Awesome. Have a thanks so day. much. Yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate Take it. Take care. Well, I don't know about you, Steve, but I think the way that Colonel Hansen ended the interview was was great because I think as Canadians, we are a humble people. Uh, we don't like to brag a lot. And if we do brag, we usually apologize for it after the fact. <laughs> but I think just like him talking about the mission and the pride that we as a country should feel uh, as part of this. And I think it's just uh, that was a great way to leave the conversation. I yeah, that, that'll that'll buckle your knees. Eh? Like that's, uh, you know, it's a really, uh, you know, you can't help but be proud. I mean, we met mm-hmm. the man today and I just, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, cheering him on. Right. So it's, uh, you know really uh really good to hear and really inspirational yeah but it also kind of makes you know makes your own you know journeys on earth kind of a little bit small in 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 one sense right you think about like the process that he's going on for the next year when they launch in i think it's november of 2024 yeah um, puts things in perspective i think we're all uh well you know what mike you gotta find your moon yeah and you gotta and you gotta strive for it right is that is that from a tiktok no find your moon (laughs) trademark pending trademark secret bell find your moon well yeah again i don't uh yeah i don't think there's really much else to say i think it was just uh this is a great episode and i mean part of a series of episodes we can now make uh focused on space experts right i mean oh, uh, so that's the one thing you know because we we i will say that now that we we were we had a very tight timeline to talk to colonel hansen so yeah we didn't ask him about space mining which is that uh, was also kind of a category we were building up uh building up a catalog in but nevertheless we did get the subbery question in there although (laughs) yeah well i mean uh yeah i think uh our catalog in space is uh really a reflection of how big of nerds we are so (laughs) maybe maybe we won't uh, publicize that too much (laughs) no i think it's too late if you're already listening to this everyone already knows that we're big nerds so i think it's it's fine but uh not news we're not breaking any news today no i don't think so so anyway I think we'll leave it there uh, from from Steve Gravel and I. Thanks for joining us. And we hope that you find your moon wherever it may be. (laughs) Bye-bye. The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining.